Okay. And I'll begin with the prayer too. Uh, it's a fourfold prayer, powers above, powers below, powers all around, draw close, open the heart and the doors of the mind that they may be in collaboration and partnership so that we can be more connected to ourselves, to one another, to all the creatures on this planet, to Mother Earth, the Ashpamama, to the Cosmic Mother, Pachamama, to the great force of life itself, Hatun. Hatun Virkacha, Pachamama, Ashpamama, to Kuishin Duan Kuyani. Welcome. Okay, today uh, we're going to build on what we were talking about and practicing last week and uh, take it a bit deeper. Uh, last week in our class, I tried to focus just on the heart, its way of perceiving things. And I said that the heart that I'm talking about is not the emotional heart. Uh, the emotional heart is really made up of parts of you subpersonalities, feelings, memories that are rich in experiences that you've had in the past and reaction patterns, that sort of thing. And the heart I'm talking about here, the heart of the shamanic heart path is not that. It's what can work with and help heal that. And uh, it's your axis mundi, I was saying, your center of the world, your center of being. Remember black uh, elk, the Lakota, Sue medicine man saying that the center of the earth is everywhere. It's in everything, even the tiniest ant. Uh, so it's in us. And uh, that's the heart I'm talking about. And uh, it's pure spirit or divinity, if you want to say that. And in the Atis Kichawa shamanic system, uh, Pachamama is part of the great spirit of life, Hatun. Uh, and uh, it's Hatun is inside it, uh, Pachamama is inside Hatun, and we're inside Pachamama, and Pachamama is inside us. So uh, we are each uh, the Pachamama, uh, walking, breathing, learning, talking, feeling, dreaming, getting hurt, getting well again. Um, it's all Pachamama. And the reason for this course is we're the only species on the planet that's a threat to the planet. And uh, we are part of uh, Mother Earth, the Ashpamama, which is part of Pachamama. So uh, it's our way of functioning, our way of thinking, our way of acting, our way of feeling that has gotten us in this mess where we treat uh, the earth and other creatures, other species, even other peoples, anything that's different from us humans, uh, often we treat without consideration, care, sensitivity, or respect. Uh, and uh, the mind has been dominated in Western civilization uh, by domination, extracting from the earth what we want, taking what we want without regard uh, to its rights to life or to be there, this sort of thing. And uh, unlike uh, many indigenous cultures around the world from time immemorial, who've had a sense of the sacrality of all life and uh, who have uh, sacrificed and uh, expressed great gratitude and even remorse when they have to take life in order to sustain themselves. Uh, it's a wholly different way of relating to life and to nature than what has become characteristic in Western civilization. And by Western civilization, I mean now a state of mind that's infecting all the continents, the entire planet. Uh, it's characterized by business, by social media, by these kind of platforms, by technology. Um, and uh, I, I love the technology. But uh, it's who's using the technology and for what purposes. It's who's using the science uh, and for what purposes. It's who is uh, using money and for what ends. Uh, that's the question. And as long as our 
society dominated by the ego, the mind, the intellect, is dominated by these ideas of taking what we want uh, without concern for other species and the right of other beings, that we are making the, uh, the planet, uh, the world that we know on the planet, uh, sick. So to heal that, we have to first heal ourselves and bring the eagle and the condor into balance in ourselves. The mind and the heart must be allies. The heart is the one that guides our steps, inspires us uh, with a vision of what we can do, be, become. It's the mind that is the planner, the organizer uh, that can help us manifest what the heart wants. But when it's the other way around, when the mind is telling us what to do, it's because we're programmed by the culture, starting with our parents and then the school systems and then the social media, the politics. And the thing is other people, nobody else knows what you should do with your life or what kind of life you should live, but you. And the only way you can know that it's purely you your true nature that's deciding what you're going to do with your life and your, your time here. The only way you can know that is to be directly connected to your heart. Okay, because it's a part of the Pachamama. It's a part of El Dios, the divine, and it knows. El Dios is just the vague general word in Spanish for the divine, for God. But uh, Unlike our Western conceptions of the divine, it's not somebody sitting up there on high, judging us, punishing us, humiliating us when we don't act right or follow the commandments. No, that, that model of divinity was modeled off the Caesars and the uh, great uh, emperors and tyrants of the Middle East, Greece and Rome and so on. And uh, it, it affected the imagery of uh, the divine as some divine potentate autocrat setting up high issuing commands and orders and punishing us when we don't obey. But uh, it's not like that in shamanism and it's certainly not like that in the Addis Kishwa tradition that I'm presenting here. Uh, because the divine is everywhere and in everything. Everything is a manifestation of it. As I said last week, Hatun is the sheer potentiality of the entire universe. It's formless spirit, the void, if you will, pregnant with possibility. And uh, every conceivable idea for every conceivable situation derives from that depth of being. But uh, Pachamama is the material manifestation uh, into form and presentation of Hatun, of the great spirit of life. So she too is uh, a tangible, a manifest form of the abstract uh, great spirit of life. And she, we can touch with our senses. She, we can connect with our heart. She gives us the vocal cords, the languages and the images to speak, to pray, to sing, to worship. And uh, really, to know her love and to love her back, uh, to help us heal, to help us correct our path. She's always speaking through the heart. And uh, she has many ways of doing that through our intuition, through our capacity to feel, which is just the felt somatic intuition, and uh, through uh, our dreams and through our visions uh, when we have them, and through synchronicities and omens that occur. And through the elements, the elements are expressions of her. The elements uh, are, are the primordial ones I was talking about last week, the, the fire, the wind, the water, the earth element. And when these are in balance, um, and they, they often work in balance with, with each other, you can't have fire without wind or air. And uh, the wood was nourished on the water as well as the sunlight and so on. So all the elements are present uh, in any of the elements that you contact. But isolating them so we can acknowledge each individual one is important. 
So the conception of the divine is one that's concrete. It's right here, it's inside us, it's everywhere around us. So all we have to do is connect. And at least since uh, Rene Descartes, this uh, philosopher, mathematician, French philosopher, uh, decided that uh, mind and nature or spirit and nature were totally separate and that we're of the mind and that nature is just some machinery. It's dead, mechanical, lifeless, so we can investigate it, explore it, open it up, extract from it whatever we want and use it however we wish. Uh, this idea, brilliant as it was for Descartes, who was a religious man, uh, has been devastating to this planet. And when combined with capitalistic greed, uh, the two together are just uh, creating this backlash. And the Pachamama, or the Earth Mother, however you want to conceptualize it, uh, is visiting us now with lots of uh, enormous uh, backlash of crises, from the global warming to the famines that we see, uh, to the riots, the fires that are going crazy. Uh, and it's not that she wishes us harm. It's a natural reaction, cause and effect. If we treat her this way, she has no choice but to react naturally as she does when she's being violated or raped or uh, torn apart. But uh, it, only we can change this. We humans are the only animal on this planet who, who doesn't know who it is. The only one that doesn't live its true nature. The only one gets lost and confused. Do you have any pets, a cat or a dog? You can, you can see right away, they are what they are. And it's the same way with the elements, wind, fire, air, water, they, they are, uh, uh, earth. They do what they do. And they know how to heal and self-correct in time. But the problem is we as a species may disappear and take a lot of species with us needlessly, foolishly, just because uh, we are disconnected and we don't realize what we're really doing. So the power to use your heart in the way I showed last week to connect with your NGS, your, that's what I call it, the, the heart compass navigational system. Uh, I asked you last week to call to mind somebody you felt uh, comfortable, good to be around and somebody you didn't feel comfortable or good to be around. And notice the difference here in the middle of your body, heart, gut region because uh, you have physical information, physical channel of information uh, about how you are responding to those people. And you can use this little compass for anything that you're navigating in life. If you uh, take a walk today outside, if it's suitable to do that, and just connect with the wind, Pay attention to where the wind leads you. you know, um, notice what you're not attracted to and what you are, what you're drawn towards and what you're repelled away from, because that's the yes and no of the heart. You know, it, it has that language. It invites you to do something, that's its yes. It says no to something else, that's its no. And that's your transpersonal will. And uh, you, then you have a personal will, you know, the part of you that can say yes to that and agree to it, or the part of you that can deny it, say no to it. And my advice is to get in agreement with your transpersonal will, get into agreement with the spirit and what it wants for you, because it has your highest, the highest ideal of you in mind and the deepest, profoundest possibilities in mind, the richest possibilities. And if you continually make decisions where you're not consulting the heart, you're not following its guidance and inspiration, then you end up more and more disconnected till at some point you're gonna be suffering a lot and uh, not happy with how your life is going because it's no longer inspired, it's no longer guided, 
uh, it's no longer expressing your true nature. It's just following the leads of the noisy mind wherever. It, and so the mind on its own is just confused. Now, another move I wanna to make today for you is in connecting with any of the elements. And today is the day of the wind, the wire mama, paying attention to the wind, which includes the air. Uh, is to realize that uh, anything in nature has an archetypal aspect. There's the archetype of the wind, the archetype of the fire, uh, the archetype of the earth, the archetype uh, of the water. And uh, when you see that, then uh, we bring the Western tradition in, uh, in this sense with the Jung's concept of the archetypes, and there's a whole nother layer of meaning although they see this too in the Kichwa tradition, that um, there's the outer uh, connection to the elements, but then there's the inner connection. And I mentioned the essence of the element or the heart of the element you want to connect to from your heart last week. But the element has many facets. So let's take wind, okay, or air. It's just the same thing. Air is a little more static. We breathe the air, so we're breathing the wind, you know, and the Greek word for that is pneuma, spirit. And uh, so to be inspired is the incoming of the breath, the incoming of the wind. It's the divine wind, though. So it's um, elevating it beyond its physical sensory qualities, you know, blowing your hat off and your hair, this sort of thing, uh, to a more subtle dimension or aspect of the wind. You know, uh, <clears throat> There's what's called a psychic wind. Uh, it's bits of memories, bits of emotions, uh, bits of desires, bits of wounds, reactive patterns. Uh, it's, it's like uh, the, uh, the garbage can, so to speak, of the human psyche, what's been uh, thrown off or stirred up in a crisis. And during the pandemic of the COVID, uh, I saw psychic contagion, you know, which is a form of psychic wind, an infection spreading across the planet, the infection of fear, and uh, an upsurge of the infection of fascism and racism, you know, the cities burning and political unrest, and it just seemed to be catching everywhere on the planet. I know you know what I'm talking about. That's the wind too. Uh, that wind is not very well, you know? So it needs a kind of calming. It needs for your relationship to the wind to become more calm and centered, you know? It's the kind of uh, vibration you send out of a peace, be still. So in this way, you're not only asking the wind for help, you're actually uh, helping it by being an emanation source of peace. And you can ask the wind for help when it's raging too, you know? Uh, and how do you do that? Well, I, I recall a storm here about 12 years ago, maybe 13, uh, where I, I live on a farm out in the country. I'm in a forest. Uh, there's 40 acres to the north of my property. And and I was out to the mailbox by the road and uh, I got my mail and I looked across the north 40 acres and I saw a tornado and it was just digging up the field, a big field of uh, dust, a whirlwind. And I knew I had to run for my house and to hide. And I ran and uh, I hid in the hallway in the middle of the house, which is the strongest part, the most reinforced part structurally. And uh, it was very noisy outside, like a train coming, you know, as the uh, tornado moved right up to my house. And then it got silent. And uh, that's when it creates a vacuum, you know? So I was thinking my house was going to explode under the vacuum pressure. I didn't know what else to do. So I talked to the spirit of the wind I imagined it as a thunder being. And I, I said, please, it's McCall here. 
I'm your ally. Spare me this devastation. And it remained silent for a few more seconds. And then there was a big explosion. And then it just got quiet again and it disappeared. I got up and I went outside and I saw my, my yard was torn up. I had uh, some big tents for ceremonies. They were torn up, blown onto other people's properties and so on. But my house was spared. And fortunately, many houses were not. But uh, I gave thanks because I knew, I felt it, that I was being listened to in that moment. And uh, it responded to that vibration that I was putting out. And so I expressed gratitude. Now I realize that's a dramatic story and we don't always have you know, dramatic examples like that that occur, but there are simpler ones. One thing about wind or the air is that different information rides on the wind. You know, I remember once being in my kitchen and I was washing dishes and I smelled something and the scent was not right. It, it, it smelled really bad. And, uh, but I couldn't find it at first, you know, I kind of, kind of looked around and I lost the scent. So then I decided to really feel and track the scent, this invisible information to its source. And I'm kind of moving through the house till I find a corner behind a couch. I move the couch out. The scent is very strong. And what I find there is a little animal, a chipmunk. It's like a miniature squirrel that probably got into the house when I opened the door or something. And my cat had got it and taken its head off. And, you know, <laughs> but it was rotting in the house. So I was able to track using the air to find precisely the point where this uh, rotting animal was. But not only there, in uh, I think 2008, I was working with my Salagi teacher out in uh, the deserts of Sedona, uh, maybe an hour or two from the Rio Verde. And uh, I was out there with my sister, Lynn, I, I remember that. And we were both being initiated uh, into that desert. And we, had, we were given different tasks. Uh, she was supposed to work with some vortexes, I think, and determine their spin, whether it was to the right or the left. But uh, my job, I was blindfolded and I was spun around. And then I was told to find each vortex. And I said, well, I, I can't do that. <laughs> I have no idea how to do that, you know. I just started walking and I noticed a change in the air quality. It would be like maybe a two degree drop in the temperature. And if I would step past that two degree drop barrier, it would disappear. If I step back to the other side, it would disappear. So I just thought, I'm going to follow this temperature line. And I would follow the temperature line straight to the vortex. And I found every vortex in that desert without fail and without knowing what I was doing. All I was doing was tracking that line in the air where the temperatures were mixing. And that line was related to the vortex, the little earth chakras, you know. My teacher was very impressed, so was I. I have no idea how I did it, but I learned something there. I learned to be a tracker and pay more attention to anything that comes to me invisibly like that. It can be a feeling, it can be an emotion, it can be looking for a memory, um, but the wind was the element that taught me that. Not, not my teacher teaching me that. She didn't know how I was gonna do it either. I think in her mind, I just had to be sensitive enough to find it. But for me, it was very concrete. And I think without the teachings of Don Alberto, I would not have paid attention to the wind. We talk a lot in this culture about intuition, you know, especially in the healing arts and in creativity, how important it is. Uh, the fact is the world's great uh, spiritual teachers all talk about the importance of intuition. It's a direct line to the divine. And uh, it's a way of knowing when you don't know how you know. And uh, 
I did a brief lecture on intuition this week on Instagram. It was a live thing somebody invited me to do. And I uh, shared a story of a uh, man I worked with uh, in therapy. His wife brought him and said, she's done. He's a couch potato. He just watches TV, drinks beer when he comes home from work. And if he doesn't change, I'm leaving. So I thought I'd give him a shot. And uh, I did five or six sessions with him. And I could only scratch the surface. If I said, how are you doing today? Or how are you faring? He would say, OK, or I'm fine. <clears throat> I said, is, has anything been bothering you? Yeah. No. So he gave me the minimal expressions as, as a way of keeping closed and not allowing me to get into his psyche. You know, so he was well defended. And after five or six sessions, uh, I didn't know what to do. I thought, I'm not going to get anywhere with this man. And I happened to have a guitar in my office. I'm a musician. And I, I grabbed it and I played Stairway to Heaven riff on, on the uh, guitar. And he came alive. And he said, that's beautiful. He said, I'm a musician too. I said, oh, tell me about that. And he said, yeah, I was part of a blues and rhythm band. And uh, then it fell apart. And I said, why did it fall apart? He said, well, the leader of the band died and just the whole thing collapsed. So now we're talking about grief. And the interesting thing is the next week he was out shopping for new guitars again. And in short order, he put another band together. His wife was very happy. He was starting to get a life again. But I asked myself, what happened there? I had no idea what I was doing. I, I just thought I'd take a breath and play the guitar. <clears throat> Maybe something would come to me. But it was actually playing the guitar that was the therapy. That's an intuition. It's also the capacity to feel, I know now because I was feeling something. I was feeling the inspiration or the invitation to pick that guitar up. At the time, I didn't know what it was. But after reflecting on it, I could see, yes, that's what it was. I was actually feeling an invitation to pick that up and play. My eagle, my intellect, well-trained with three doctorates, did not know how to help this man. But something else did. Now, the invitations arise in the middle of, a, of the body. They arise from the heart. That's inspiration. And that's where the guidance came. And that's what helped this man. And it came through me. It wasn't me. It came through me. So with each of the elements, they can teach you something. And they can heighten your skills to connect with other forms of life beyond them and other dimensions of their own elemental quality. You know, fire, for example. I mean, just get in touch with your inner poet. You know, there's different ways to express what fire is. You know, it's the flame of desire. You know, the burning heat of passion. It can also be wrath and rage. You know, if the fire may be not in good condition or safe condition, you know. Uh, and if you're building a fire, let's say you're building a sacred fire, that fire guardian has to know how to collaborate with the wind and the flame in order to have a powerful but safe fire. Fire can be creative, it can be destructive. That's part of its beautiful nature. If you have something you need to let go or spit into the fire, vomit into the fire, that's a great place to do it. It'll transform that. But if it's not guarded, if it's not tended, it can get out of control. It can, it can do harm. And it's our responsibility to be stewards of the fire. So that means uh, assessing the wind situation. Sometimes you shouldn't build a fire, uh, but maybe a candle is, is, is possible. You know? And I've had fire ceremonies in a forest where we just brought a little glass uh, uh, lantern to put a candle in so the wind could not get inside it. You know? And we'd light it for the fire ceremony and blow it out after. So there's no chance of a forest fire. But in many cases, you can have uh, 
gentle breezes and this sort of thing and have a wonderful fire, well tended, well guarded, you know. And then that fire can really illuminate you and the fire and the wind collaborate together. Like in the ceremony I mentioned last week where I was upset stomach, nauseated and asked my heart what to do. And it seemed to say, build a sacred fire on a very cold, windy day. And I did that. I built the fire and as I'm building it, my nausea and sickness start to leave. Gets better and better. And by the time the fire's really going, uh, and I'm singing my fire song, and I'm completely well. And then I give thanks for it. You know? When I say the divine is responsive to you, that's what I mean. Uh, and uh, it receives what you're feeling, it receives your prayers, it receives your requests, and it formulates the best answer it can, and it offers it back to you. If you're paying attention, and if you are, then it's a good idea to give thanks. That strengthens the relationship, strengthens the possibility that you're likely to get more help. Now, in the Andean healing system, the elements are used to diagnose and treat you. They can tell whether you need more water, or more earth, or more air, or some combination of them. If you're sick, your kidneys are shut down, that's a water issue. So the shamans are going to work with you in water, you know. And they may also work with the earth element, which is how, how, how to nourish you best with the love of the earth mother. And that may be food, it may be some other kind of medicine, some plant medicine, for example. But the whole system uh, looks at it in terms of the four elements, the relations between the two, the imbalances, and the need to restore equilibrium. And that's interpreted on every level of the psyche, from the most physical to the most archetypal and metaphorical. Okay, let's uh, pause for a minute and uh, let me ask you to just close your eyes and drop down to the middle of your body again. And um, imagine a time that you were connecting with an element. Maybe it was the wind, maybe it was the fire, maybe it was another element. But just notice there in the middle of your body what you feel when you bring that memory to mind. Let's, let's pick one, a memory that's meaningful to you. And maybe it was beautiful, maybe it was a blessing. And just notice what your, your heart compass is telling you there about that. And when you notice that, then take a deep breath and come back. I like to work with fire a lot, and I consider myself a fire shamanist. You can pick an element that especially resonates for you. You still work with all four, but uh, so for me, it's it's a fire. Uh, for more than a decade, I worked with Mente in Europe and still work with her. I just haven't been there since the pandemic, but she's a water shamanist. 
And I learned a lot from her about the power of water to heal, and especially its power with women. But for me, uh, for the last 25 years or so, people have come from all over the world to go on my forest intensives. Sometimes they're vision quests, sometimes they're healing uh, intensives. But uh, I can't tell you how many times I've seen people come and they were all disconnected, but they know they needed what I was offering. We got out there onto an island in Lake Michigan, beautiful island with an enormous forest and magnificent views. And we built a base camp with a fire and uh, how just the element of fire created these revelations for them and these clarities, as well as created communities, all kinds of connectedness, you know. I remember one guy, he was a dentist and he was bored with his job. He was making a lot of money and he had focused on his career and he was about 50 and he just lost the joy in what he was doing. He didn't want to do it anymore. <clears throat> and he came out there. One night we'd all gone to bed. He wanted to stay by the fire and tend it. And uh, we have cedar logs up north. So he's the smell of cedar smoke was circulating around him. Suddenly he noticed the stars and the Milky Way, which is beautiful up on South Manitou Island. And he said, I've never felt more alive my whole life. This is how I want to be. This is how I want to live. And so uh, when he got home, uh, it didn't take him very long. He sold his dental practice and he bought a horse farm. Horses was his true love. And there he could reconnect with the land, reconnect with the elements. You can imagine how that goes. It's just a power of fire. You know, my role was very small. It was a fire working with that guy. So now I'd like to ask you just to share what your experiences have been with maybe the meditation we just did or any memory that you have of working with the wind or the fire. So if you're there, Ryan, you can uh, open it up. Yeah, um, I've got a couple questions that have come through. Maybe would you like to address those first and then I can open it up to people yeah, sure. live? Yeah, sure. Okay. So um, if you would like to uh, share something with Michael or uh, ask him a question live, just use the raise your hand function and then I can get to you. Uh, so down at the bottom of your screen, if you click on reactions, you should see an option that says raise hand. So just do that and um, I'll put you in the queue. Uh, so Michael, something came through and uh, let me just see if I can get it into a clear question. I think it's a really good one actually and it relates to what happens when we're here in a workshop with someone like you and also uh, on social media like you're talking about earlier and then in conversations with strangers. I think it's just relevant to what you're speaking to earlier. So uh, if, if something is said or done that makes one uncomfortable that triggers something in you. How do you recommend that we deal with that in the moment? Any advice? Yeah, without, without knowing the details on that, <clears throat> I just have to uh, do as good as I can with that. But, um, so there's a difference between responding and reacting. So uh, reacting is kind of a knee jerk thing. Uh, responding is where you can sit centered and reflect on it, you know, and bring a wider perspective or multiple viewpoints to it, you know, before uh, you do something with it. So uh, I think the move is to get from a reactive state into a more responsive state. And to do that, you have to get centered. You have to open your heart. You know, um, but if I had an example, it could help. Uh, yeah, I think it, um, something, I don't want to get specific actually, uh -huh. it's, uh, uh -huh. but I think that that's just good advice. So working with the attention 
Um, okay. Um, there is another thing that came through about um, asking if you have any thoughts about people's concerns with uh, matters of cultural appropriation when working with uh, practices from traditions that aren't our own. And if you could address that. Yes, I, I do. Um, it's very important. So first, let me say what I'm teaching here, I'm authorized to teach as part of the Pachacuti prophecy. And uh, these are uh, South American elders uh, who have taken the trouble to find people like myself who are willing uh, to collaborate with them and uh, teach the teachings that are relevant for people in the industrial north, meaning Western civilization. So that's one kind of authorization. I think it's very important, okay? But I'm not going to teach you a Lakota pipe ceremony. You know, I'm not going to take anything from uh, another culture and appropriate it as my own. I may be inspired to find my own way and uh, bring in uh, my Western traditions to that so that it has roots in our own cultural soil and it's not something that's extracted colonialist style from another culture. Um, so I think that's pretty important. Uh, I don't know if there's more that's being asked there than what I've addressed, but I'm open to it if there is. Yeah, well, we can open it up to anyone who's here with us live. If you have uh, something you wanna share or a question to ask, as I said, you can raise your hand. Uh, so I see Raven has got her hand up. Raven, uh, can you unmute and see your spotlight? Hey, there you go. I just like, okay, white privilege, full frigging awareness at the core depths of what, you know, a Western viewpoint of shamanism. I just wanted to really reiterate from my own experience that for anybody worried about cultural appropriation has roots in the earth <laughs> that is not an ex extraction. I just really wanted to like echo um, Dr. McCall from like just having that viewpoint every time that I have opened up authentically with the lens of just shining light and leveraging my own privilege to then inspire people connecting to the lands that they're on, making sure that we're honoring things. I just wanted to offer that as perhaps like, you know, it takes courage, I think, for us to like root down and make sure the path has a heart when we're, be, but at a core, I kind of look at it like we don't want these practices to all of a sudden just be gone. So hopefully that helps inspire more people to like just talk about it because when we're talking about it and reflecting at heart you'll get the reflections you need to like adjust and make sure that that's in alignment with something bigger than the self mm -hmm. and that's all i want to add <laughs> mm -hmm. so cultural appropriation is just a variation of uh extraction from uh, the earth, taking things that are not ours, you know, and using them uh, in ways that uh, actually harm or cause pain for others. Uh, so uh, I think the whole colonialist uh, paradigm has to go. But that doesn't mean we can't learn from one another and enter into collaborative relationships with people from other cultures, I think. That's as important as we become a global community. But each culture needs to maintain their own identity and uh, drink from their own deep wells. And we have them in the West. And not just in, uh, you know, I, I, I cited Jung all the way back to, you know, Nietzsche, Goethe, Plato, way back. But that is uh, just a central line that stems from. Uh, modern depth psychology of Jung back through European history. But there's all these different indigenous uh, ancient cultures all over Europe, Northern Europe, Southern Europe, Eastern Europe, uh, and on into Asia. 
that uh, have been covered up for centuries, neglected, rejected, you know, I'm thinking of Celt traditions or Celtic as we French call it Celtic, <laughs> Irish and Brits call it Celt. But, uh, you know, these are very fascinating shamanistic cultures. People are reclaiming their roots, they're reclaiming Viking roots and this sort of thing, Teutonic roots. Um, and on it goes. And I think this is all fine. I recall Jung saying that uh, he was uh, miffed by how quickly people look for wisdom outside of their own culture and will believe anything that comes from another culture and uh, worship it. Uh, and he saw this as a form of self alienation and unwillingness to dig in your own roots, your own ancestry. And we have a problem. Uh, in our connection with our elders and our ancestors of the past. So I think it's a good idea to say this, whoever asked the question, I thank you for it. It's easy to project, right. it's easy to project the spirit or healing or wisdom, whatever, on a culture outside ourselves, you know. Yeah, okay, Kai, just uh, unmute and you should spotlight hi brian hey michael thank you for the second session um i wanted to just touch on the fire ceremony that we discussed from last <laughs> week and yeah that night from like last saturday i i created my own sacred fire and i've i've made a lot of fires over my time a lot of camping and traveling and creating this heat source to you know, survive in the woods, but I'd never come to a fire from a place of ceremony or ritual or communicating and connecting with the element and the God, the fire God behind it. So yeah, I just wanted to sh share my experience that it was a very profound intention experience. I offered the fire some, some of my writings that I wanted to let go of. I gave it some food, I prayed, and it was just, yeah, a very profound experience in a different way, a new way that I've looked at using fire. I have never in the past. And uh, so, yeah, thank you for that. And uh, yeah, getting a lot out of this experience. Thanks, I love hearing that and knowing how it went for you. Yes, uh, you can evoke the, the spirit or the deity behind anything. And uh, it takes you to a, a deeper depth in that element that you're working with, okay? And as I discovered uh, with the fire god that I work with, um, I just call it a god because that's what it seems like it is, you know? Uh, and it's not mine, you know? It's, it's not like a personal spirit. It's not a, um, something that just belongs to me, uh, but it helps a lot in my healing work, whether it's on myself or if I'm working with someone else. And it strengthens the connection. I mean, when you do ceremony, you know, you prepare things in a reverent way. Uh, you place the wood together in a certain way. You offer prayers for the ceremony uh, and you give thanks. Uh, that bringing the ritual uh, artistry to it, okay, deepens the level at which you're going in with that element. And of course, makes the encounter more powerful. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for your comments. Yeah, great. Um, Michael, I'm reminded you're speaking about uh, Jung's idea of archetype and how some of the people you've worked with in the Andean tradition, they also have a sense of the archetype. They may have different language for it. And it reminded me, I was talking to Jeremy Narby, who's a cultural mm. anthropologist. I know Jeremy, yeah. Yeah, and he was telling me about how his friend, who's a South American shaman, the way he talked about it, and immediately, you know, uh, seeing it with the psychological viewpoint, I could see he was talking about archetypes, but he would talk about how everything has a mother. So uh, whether, you know, they consider tobacco to be a kind of masculine spirit, but then they would talk about the mother of tobacco, uh, mother of ayahuasca, mm -hmm. mother of fire. And it clicked to me like, ah, the, that's we're it. getting down to that archetypal level, that's the mother it. of the thing. That's yeah. it. Yeah, the mamas are expressions of the, uh, 
the great mother, the Pachamama, you know, in this uh, ayahuasca ikaro, which I'll sing, uh, you can feel it. Kushi kushi mamas, kushi kushi mamas, light I did die. Light I did, 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 Kushi kushi mamas, kushi kushi mamas, la da di di da. Nina mama, yaku mama, ashba mama, waira mama, la da di di da da, la da di 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 di, la da di di da da, la da di di di. So the mama is evoking the word is evoking the archetypal aspect the great mother the pachamama as uh an expression an essence of or the heart of the element yeah great uh, we've got another question that came through in the chat um they're asking can you speak to how our emotions get in the way of hearing or sensing with our heart is there a simple way we can know the difference? Also wondering about how the heart closes in response to trauma and wounding. Yeah, and the question on that note is, uh, oh, we're talking about the emotional heart closing or the, the uh, axis moody heart, you know. But um, what was the first question on the first part of that? Can you speak to how our emotions get in the way of hearing and sensing with our heart? Is there a simple way we can know the difference? Yeah. They're asking about the difference between the emotional heart and the uh, archetypal heart or however you yeah. created that. Right, so the emotional heart is gonna be attached to a memory. So if a part of you is coming up, it's gonna have a memory that goes along with it or a, a history, a story. Uh, and, and memories are kind of stories like dreams are. So, uh, so the thing is to get in your heart center, you know, align with Axis Mundi, get in the place of love and calmness, and take a good look from that state of consciousness at the part that's wanting something out of pain, out of fear or out of hopelessness or discouragement, you know? And you, you essentially, the metaphor is to open the heart and include that part in the loving and in the centering. So that it's enfolded and that heart can uh, contract around it. That is, it kind of gives it a hug, you know? Uh, and one can like put your hand on your armpit, other hand like this, and you can hug that part, you know, embrace it with love. It's something I do all the time. The method, I, I learned that from Stephen Levine. I don't know if any of you know him and his, his somatic uh, work, and I applied it shamanically. I do self soul retrievals, and I teach people that I'm working with on soul retrievals to do that too, to open the heart and bring the part back in. Often the parts, they're not just out there somewhere in the shaman's cosmos or in the spirit world. They're stuck in memories. And we're gonna talk about that kind of stuff uh, in the next two weeks, because we start looking at challenges and then at healing. And uh, so we'll have a lot more to say there. But what I just explained is uh, kind of an idea of how the heart that is your center of being, your absolute core, axis mundi, how that is loving and has a role to play. It's a bigger consciousness that can embrace any part that is distraught or discomforted or hurt or reactive. And it can calm that part down and it can love it. It can care for it. It can update it, you know, and it can do it tangibly like I showed. <clears throat> That's great. I think that ties into that original question about what to do when we feel an emotional trigger happen. Uh, how can we respond to it and not uh, just react to it? But uh, yeah, I think that ties in. That's great. And um, 
yep, that answered that person's question through the chat. So thank you for that. And uh, I think, okay, no one else has their hand up. So we're gonna take that as a cue that we can move on. Last call. All right, Mike, I'll hand it back to you. Okay. So, so far I haven't said much about archetypes or Jungian psychology. I, I, I wanna turn there because uh, uh, Jung brings in more relationship of the eagle, you know, with his concepts and understandings. And uh, whereas up to now I focused on the feeling side and the intuitive side of the heart psychology. Uh, now I want to show how Jung can also help bridge heart and mind together in a way that uh, creates equilibrium, balance, well-being, you know. And particularly, I want to speak to his concept of the, the archetypes. You know. And uh, Jung uh, was very shamanistic in, as I, in my book, uh, Jung and Shamanism Dialogue, I lay out just how shamanistic he was, point by point. Uh, but um, it was his lifestyle uh, it was his uh, psycho-spiritual practices. Uh, nobody lived a more passionately uh, religio-spiritual life than Carl Jung. I mean, this is a man that uh, had his own crack up, descended into the underworld, faced his demons. Uh, I mean, he uh, called out uh, to the spirit of the times. <laughs> And then he called out to the spirit of the depths and he realized he had to get away from the spirit of the times. That's the zeitgeist because his life up to that point was about fame, success, achievement, how great he was, that sort of thing. Okay. And he meets a figure in there, a series of them actually become his guardian spirit, his daimon, philemon. But one by one, they address all these mistakes that he's making. And he's confronted, you know, with his own grandiosity, his own uh, superficial desire for wealth, fame, uh, recognition, and all that. And he realizes that cannot sustain his soul, that cannot sustain his life. And he has to let all that go. And he ends up in a kind of a religion of his own, where he's got his own guardian spirit, Philemon. And... Uh, he, he does calligraphy eventually, and he creates the beautiful red book after he documented everything in like eight volumes of black books. He makes this big uh, illuminated manuscript with paintings that are visionary and just incredible in nature, showing his relationship with the spirit world. And then that wasn't enough. He had to build a chapel for this guardian spirit or daimon, philemon, and that's what's known as the bowling and tower and the different layers, different floors on it and gates and courtyards. It's a place where he ended up spending half of his life every year past a certain age. And he said, without that place, my life's work would not have come into being. He says, at bowling and I'm in the midst of my true life. I'm one with the wind and the waves, the sound of the crickets, the ancestors and ghosts that dance by the property and so on. He just goes on and on. This is, this is a man deeply immersed in and connected to nature, to the great mother, to his guardian spirit, who is a revelation of the divine. If, if you have an entity like that, that you've discovered, okay, that's like guiding you, inspiring you, uh, this is the mask the divine wears to reveal itself to you in a specific form. And Jung created a chapel to Philemon. He carved his dreams and his visions into stone and in wood. He paints on the second floor, I think it is, where, where he builds his bedroom. He's got a vaulted ceiling. He paints a picture of Philemon with his wings stretched across the ceiling and gold stars on the ceilings of the horns of a kingfisher. So he can lay there every night and every morning and connect to his own guardian spirit or dhamma. And the problem for him became, okay, how do I translate this to the world? Because they're not going to buy what I'm doing. They're going to think I'm some mystical kook. 
And in his day to be a mystic uh, was a big insult. You know, he wanted to be taken seriously. So he translates all of that shamanistic experience into concepts like complex archetype, his theory of libido. Uh, and then he looks for images that he could maybe unpack it more, mythopoetic images. And he stumbles on alchemy and he sees he can work with that and kind of draw people into alchemy, which in many ways is very close to shamanism, but it's a little more palatable in Europe. There's been a tradition uh, in recent centuries of the alchemical work. And uh, so we have the academic young or professional young and his writings, you know, and I've read the whole corpus, the collected works, you know, and, uh, and I've read the red and black books. And believe me, the red and black books are more interesting because here you see the master shaman at work doing his craft. And in the collected works, you see the guy that created something that his culture could use, or this concept of psychology and this sort of thing. But uh, the, real, the real young and the real way he lived and practiced uh, is very mystical. And it's all summed up in that red book. So I want to make that point. So Jung's concept of the archetypes, initially uh, he noticed patterns. Uh, I think his first term was nodal points. These were energy patterns, uh, might show up in myth and art and this sort of thing. And uh, then he called them primordial images. Primordial images are the gods the fairies, the spirits, the ghosts, the ancestors that show up in myth and poetry, heroes too, uh, and folklore, art, and architecture. Think Gothic cathedrals and that sort of thing and the different gargoyles and so on that are carved in there along with the saints. You've got heavens and hells in these cathedrals of Europe. I know because I've been in many of them and uh, they're amazing and they're crypts and everything. You know. uh, Whole, whole cosmology. And Jung himself said that uh, the collective unconscious uh, is equivalent of the spirit world, what uh, mystics and shamanists mean when they talk about that. And he said, because uh, William James said something similar, and he commented on William James, he said, and sometimes it's the more right term to use. But he wouldn't publish that in his professional works. You find this side of Jung in his letters to people and conversations with people. You don't get the, the, the Jung that he put out there as a pioneer in depth psychology. Um, but uh, that's how he was and, and who he was. And uh, yet he believed it had to be translated into some rational language so that it could fly, it could live in this culture and people could find a way to connect with the depths, connect with the center, with the heart, which for him was the archetypal self. And uh, if you could live in alignment with that, you could embrace the opposites. The eagle and the condor for Jung could fly in the same skies. And that's what he called wholeness. And it's not just those two opposites, it's all of them, the opposites. It's a space big enough to hold everything. So he came up with the word archetype because uh, of his relationship with this woman, Sabina Spielerein, who was a brilliant psychoanalyst that was studying with Jung. And she actually suggested the term, thought it was better than primordial image. And it's a term that Plato used, Jung knew that, but. Uh, Unfortunately, he published it. He didn't give Spielerine credit, which he later apologized for, but it's too late. You know, it's name stuck on it. But this uh, word archetype means many different things. It means nodal points. It means energies. It means patterns. Uh, it means gestalt processes. Uh, it, for Jung, often means form of an instinct. It gives any instinct its pattern, its code that it'll operate on. For example, the mating instinct. Uh, we all feel that for human in some form or another, you know, and uh, okay, let, let's say how it works out. You're attracted to somebody, you hang out together, you find resonance, you end up falling in love. Falling in love, you're, you're ecstatic, you just see beauty in the other person, uh, you just want to be together, you can't stop talking together, you start thinking alike, you know, then it's blissful, it's a phase of coming together. 
But then pretty soon, I mean, if you're staying with that archetype, it's going to hook the next archetype that's related. And let's build a nest together. Let's move in together. Let's, let's get a home, a mortgage. And then that's going to hook the parenting archetype. Let's have offspring. Let's have babies. And this sort of thing. So one archetype fires off another. So the instinct is being channeled or directed through the intellectual structure of the archetype. And that comes from the great mother, the Pachamama herself. That intelligence is seeded or planted in nature everywhere. And keep in mind, the animals and the plants experience archetypal powers too, okay? There are many species that do the mating and the parenting thing and that are nest builders. Wolves clear out dens. Some animals like bears like the caves and, and mountain lions and this sort of thing, you know? And uh, they connect sexually. They give birth to their offspring. Uh, the Indian condor, they, they're a pair. They mate for life, you know? And they have a baby, a baby every other year. And uh, that's why they're an endangered species now. But uh, my point is humans aren't the only ones. You know, we, we participate in an archetype that's shared by many animal species and plants too have their own archetypes and they root down deep beneath the soil and they rise up and they open and spread and unfold in their wholeness and their beauty. Uh, so they're symbols for lotuses and, and mystic roses and mandalas everywhere across the planet because uh, any archetype is a mirror of our own nature. So we can learn from plants, we can learn from trees, we can learn from any animal they serve as a mirror. And one of the first steps in entering the shamanic path is to get familiar with the animals and the plants around you. What you can learn from a cat or a dog and what you can learn from any kind of bird. Just study that bird, okay? Or whatever the animal is. And it will start to mirror back usually potentials that you're not developing or actualizing. Okay, some are good hunters, some are good stalkers, some are uh, amazing with their scent, sense of smell, you know. Buzzards have an incredible sense of smell. Interestingly, condors don't have any sense of smell, but they have an eyesight and a huge wingspan. So they can ride the wind currents, what they call the, the, the warm uh, updrafts that keep them hovering. And they're not looking for carrion. They're looking for buzzards who do have a sense of smell. Buzzards find the carrion. And the condors <laughs> move in where the buzzards are. Yeah, and they can see this at 25,000 feet sailing on the updrafts of the air. They clean up the environment, they fly high. It's a great symbol for spirit and earth honoring spirituality. Notice the picture behind me, the painting done by Michael Johnson. Uh, it's an archetypal image. It's got a bird-like form, could be the condor, could be any bird that's ascending on the winds into the celestial, into the divine. He gave me this painting, but Michael, I, I don't know if he's tuning in or not. I think he was last week. Michael gifted me this thing. He painted it maybe 15 years ago or so. Uh, he's a member of the Crow's Nest community here in Michigan. And uh, when Michael first came out here, we did a, a kind of a sweat lodge, my style. Uh, I've got a square room with hot rocks like a Scandinavian sauna that we do a sacred ceremony with. Anyway, in there, he saw a totem pole and uh, he saw a big corvid bird on top of it with a rainbow. Now, he didn't know, that's actually the image for my own uh, shamanic, chief shamanic guide. And uh, about a year later, he came out here and he asked to cut up some down trees, use the logs to carve a totem pole, which he did. 
And then he put the corvid bird on it, whether it's a crow or a raven is debatable, but there it is. And then the big rainbow on top of that. And then he asked if he could come out and install it on my property. I was very honored and he came out and the day he picked was my birthday. Now, you know, he, he's got my shamanic guide, uh, the chief one, and he's got my birthday. He's given it to me. He, he's not conscious of this. He just does it. He's like that. Oh, okay. So he brings it out here and we're both delighted to talk about what this meant to me, you know, but it's stunning. The totem pole is still in good shape and on the property. But this painting was made shortly after. And the thing about Michael's paintings, okay, they're very shamanistic and uh, he's in love with leaves, trees, this sort of thing. So every part of that painting is a leaf. Much of it taken from off this property, but also from other places, I think along the Lake Michigan shorelines. And he painted them and he put them together on this canvas. I think the name of the painting is Ascending Spirit. You can correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, so there's an archetype for you coming through. And what makes it archetypal is it's not real detailed. It's the form. You can feel it. You can feel its direction. You can feel its energy. It's got a numinous quality to it. And when there's a numinous quality, which means a kind of holy, uh, fascinating, uh, a mystery quality to it. Uh, that's a sign you're in the presence of an archetype. And I decided to sit here today because wind is the theme, the element theme for the day. I thought it would be good to have it there. But these archetypes, you know, bees dance, that's a kind of an archetype, dancing, you know, the gesturing of that, the beauty of it, and the survival value of it, and the expressiveness of it. Mm -hmm. Think of the peacock's tail, and that type of ritual mating dance, and the beauty associated with it. Uh, all through nature, the Pachamama, has seeded and planted these forms that become manifest, including the fractals that are everywhere evident in nature. So we can connect with these archetypes. We can see them. We can express appreciation for them. And sometimes we see them embodied in actual primordial images, that is in the spirits, in, in gods, and ancestors, and so on. There's no reason that you can't uh, do something like what Jung did and set down your experiences, whatever you see or you feel or you imagine into some type of art, some type of symbolism that reminds you of what you've experienced and honor it that way and beautify your life and beautify your house. I find when you do that, you create a deeper connection with the archetypal figures or beings that you're connecting to. And it's important to have a relationship to them. You don't wanna be taken over by them. Um, this was a big point by Jung, is that you not be invaded or hijacked by them. You know, it's a defining characteristic of shamanism too, to have a relationship. So let's say this bird in the painting that you see there, let's say that's my guardian spirit, okay? Then I'm gonna approach it with gestures of respect. I'm gonna talk to it, hold conversations with it imaginal dialogues. I'm going to merge with it sometimes so I can see things or feel things through its form. And I can do that with any animal for that matter. But my point is, the more I plug in in these various ways to whatever I'm working with, the more I learn about me or about some problem I'm considering. I even have entities that guide me on clients that I'm working with, you know those places where I need a bigger perspective. 
So uh, I'll do a shamanic journey, I'll merge as a form of feeling to merge with these entities and uh, see things through its bigger eyes. And the shaman's guiding spirits, guardian spirits live, they dwell in the heart. That's where they're, they're accessed. So when you open the heart, if you've welcomed them in, that's where, that's where they live. And there's one in particular, it's like Jung Stolimon. In the Americas, they call it the guardian spirit, but it's been called in Europe, in the European traditions, the daemon or daemon, D-A-E-M-O-N, not demon. If, if you neglect your daemon, then it's going to have to force itself on you, invade you. And so it, it appears to be a demon that, you know, it's creating havoc in your life because you're repressing it or ignoring it, not respecting it. But uh, what a daemon means is it's a force that guides and inspires you. And in the Middle East, Middle East they call them fravashi. Uh, in the Catholic traditions, it's your guardian angel. Uh, in the Asian traditions, you get uh, Ishtadiva, you get the Yidam deity, this sort of thing. It's the same thing. But we all have a particular uh, manifestation or presentation of the divine that we can personally connect with and through. And we receive guidance and blessing and protection and so on from that. Now, that entity always dwells in the heart and is another expression of your axis mundi. So when you use your power to feel and you use that heart compass, you are actually responding to its direction through the heart. And if you prefer not to conceive it that way or imagine it that way, that's fine too. Then your heart just becomes your guardian spirit, your diamond. The results are exactly the same uh, if you treat it as such. So when I ask my heart to help me with my nausea, I get the same results. If I take on a shamanic journey and I'd ask my guardian spirit or some other uh, shamanic spirit to help me, I probably would have gotten help the same way. The main thing is that you ask for help and that you honor it. So roughly this is the Jungian, the classical Jungian part in my interpreting it in terms of shamanism. And uh, Jung had a lot to say about shamanism because he had uh, a friendship with Mircea Iliadi, who was also a teacher of mine and mentor. And um, uh, Jung used Iliadi's work, his vast uh, scholarship on shamanism around the planet to reflect on it from his own point of view. He saw great resonance, which in my little classic Jung and shamanism dialogue that he wrote 31 years ago, 32 years ago, uh, I rigorously show that what Jung's view was exactly about every detail you can think of in shamanism and compare them and contrast them. So Jungian psychology is highly aligned with shamanistic uh, heart path, highly aligned. They're not identical, but they are very similar. And I chose uh, Jungian psychology as a way to bridge the shamanic with the Western consciousness. It's a way of bringing ego and condor together. Although there's certainly big condor elements in Jung's psychology, but that's what made it easy for me to bridge the shamanic and the depth psychological with Jung. Now there's one other type of archetype I'm gonna talk about, and uh, then I'll take some questions. Well, this is a foundational archetype. And um, uh, Tony Wolf mapped out four foundational archetypes of the feminine. And then my doctoral chair, Robert Moore, mapped out four archetypes of the archetypal masculine. Uh, for me, at this point in our cultural history, making these, this gender conversation is dated and it's uh, uh, got Victorian concepts of what's masculine and what's feminine in it, the anima and the animus. So I have chosen, uh, especially in this era of LGBTQ, I have chosen to drop that uh, way of speaking. And uh, I just wanna know what are the four foundational archetypes that men and women share uh, or regardless of gender. 
every human has to deal with these. So I modified the scheme of Robert Moore and uh, of Tony Wolf to uh, express it the way I saw it. And uh, these foundational archetypes are archetypes you have to be connecting to in order to manifest what you're here to manifest in your life, in order to fulfill your purpose. You have to have these enough on the line that it can happen. And if you don't, then you use these four archetypes to help you self-assess so you can know where you need to work and develop something. And these archetypes are the archetypal lover or the lover within, the shaman within, the elder within, and the warrior within. And they emerge from the center, the axis mundi, and unfold themselves over time. You come in with these archetypes and potential. Now let's start at the bottom. If you could see my little mandala, I've created a series of mandalas to illustrate my own psychoshamanic views. But in this one, it's just illustrating, like at the bottom or the southern part of this little mandala, the lover. And you'll notice from the center come these arrows, you know, just represent the energetic direction of filling out of these different sectors of the psyche uh, in each quadrant. But there are arrows, there's also tiny arrowheads at, at the center too. So the energies flow both ways. But essentially, the lover is your power to connect, to affiliate, to align, uh, to fall in love, of course, but to also be compassionate, unconditional love infinite compassion. And uh, these are the inherent positive qualities. And uh, let's say if you're going to be a shamanist, you need this one really developed because uh, love is the medicine. It really is. And uh, if your your mind or your patient's mind is filled with judgment, self-hatred, self-criticism, perfectionism, a sort of thing, that means love is not ruling there. Uh, they need help with that. But if you're the therapist or the healer and you haven't developed your own lover to its fullest capacities and its highest capacities, then you're not even going to see that or know how to help it or be able to help it because you're not loving yourself. So we always have to start with ourselves and take that lover to the max. There is a shadow side to all of these, as Robert Moore pointed out. Okay. So the shadow side for me is the part that's not developed. And in, as far as you've not developed the lover very well, then you could be needy and greedy. You could be addictive. Uh, you could be manipulative. You could be using your sexuality to manipulate or to make yourself feel loved or important or so on. We can go on and on. I just want to give you the idea. So the shadow side of the lover is the undeveloped side of the lover, where love is not, then you get those as substitutes. Now the shaman on the left, that's in the westerly direction there. Uh, I wish it said shamanist, but that takes up a lot of space. So we just left it the shaman within. Robert Moore has that as the, the magus, the magician. But I said, no, it's the shaman within. And he did put that in the title of his book, is a subheading. Uh, but uh, I'm only interested because I, I'm teaching from the shamanic frame, framework. I, I use it here. Uh, uh, so the development of the shamanist powers have to do with opening your heart, developing your capacity to feel, developing your intuition, becoming embodied, and then looking from a centered place at yourself, getting to know your own psyche and the whole spectrum of your consciousness, and then able to look at others in the same way and uh, become a technician of the sacred, which uh, shamanists are. Uh, technician of the sacred means you know ways, you know ceremonies, you know practices, maybe you know chants or you know strategies to help people uh, see through themselves, how to find clarity, how to find their way to love see what else is not developed in their psyche and to see what is missing that should be there but it isn't usually because of trauma some parts have flipped off or they're they're being held in memories 
that get triggered all the time and create chaos. So the, the, the shamanist foundational archetype has to do with our capacity to be psychologically conscious, intuitive, and uh, perceptive of what's going on in the inner world of ourselves and others. Now the elder, or this for Robert Moore was the king, but I'm trying to get out of these rigid hierarchies too. So uh, I'm more comfortable with the elder. I consider myself not simply older, but elder. And uh, the fullness of an elder is a generative person who cares for his people, not just his grandchildren, but his tribe, his, his community or her community, uh, and for the uh, landscape itself and the other uh, denizens of planet Earth, uh, cares for the future generations, cares what values are being handed down and speaks out. So to be an elder, you have to have a strong voice and you have to be determined, get yourself out there and to be offering your wisdom. Otherwise you're just sinking into a maybe a nice retirement, maybe a frustrated retirement, because you're not realizing your potential. If you're my age, you ought to be an elder. And if you're not, it's a problem for our species. But an elder can bless, guide, inspire. Those are the positive qualities that we want to see and care for future generations, lend a hand and so on, and hold up an image of what's possible for the younger generations. Shadow side of the elder archetype is what's undeveloped. And that shows up as dogmatism, authoritarianism, rigid rules, uh, judgment, um, making things harder than they need to be, being jealous or envious of other teachers, other elders, this sort of thing. Um, so these qualities, uh, when the shadow side is what's coming out, uh, usually do a lot of damage and they create scandals and uh, so on. And the warrior is really charged with the mission of the elder. But the elder, we all have that in us potentially. I say if you're younger, uh, you aspire to that. If you're middle life or approaching middle age, mentor would be the appropriate midway point for this, okay? You've got enough life experience, let's say by 40, you've got, uh, you've worked hard on yourself, uh, you've got wisdom, you've got creativity, you love, you know you can do something to help. And that happened to me too. So you're a mentor, you're a guide. You're not an old man or an old woman yet. You're not a crone, not, not an old sage, but you're moving in that direction. And uh, you can't realize your totality without it. If you grow old and uh, you have not attained wisdom and a burden for your species, you, in some sense, failed at life. In indigenous cultures, they cherish their elders. They call them grandfathers or grandmothers in the Americas. And that's a archetypal uh, acknowledgement of their importance. And the warrior is the determination, the focus, the courage, the discipline to sustain you in doing something that's worth doing and having a purpose that doesn't just serve yourself. It does that. It helps you become who you are, but helps your community, helps your children, but also other people's children, helps your neighbors, helps people of other races, of other socioeconomic classes, of other uh, cultures, and so on. The warrior is that energy which enables us to reach out and manifest things that benefit not only ourselves, but others. And a warrior knows how to protect, have strong boundaries. 
And, you know, every cell in your body or every cell in anything has protective forces. We all have immune systems. Protecting is part of biology. You can't just have anything passing through the membranes. And so it is with our psychic life, our love life, our social life. We must have boundaries to contain and hold the gifts and the energies that we're bringing to the world. And so the warrior represents that principle of protecting and defending what's worth protecting and defending. And the shadow side is what's undeveloped there. The warrior can be a workaholic, can be addicted to aggression, achievement, overachievement, can be seeking importance or fame when that's not the point. Now, each of these foundational archetypes work for each other. So you can't be an elder without the lover. And you've got to be a bit of a warrior and shaman too. And the same goes for any of them. To be a lover, you've got to have an elder quality. You also have got to have a fierce warrior and protective quality. And you've also got to have the kind of open consciousness and open heart and clarity of a shaman. So just like the elements, these four foundational archetypes all hang together and they are uh, archetypal ground print or blueprint for your unfolding development and wholeness. And you can actually use these, you can create diagrams and I have where you shade in different elements to see how much of the, the lover you feel you've developed and how much of the shaman and to identify any shadow aspects. All that can be beautifully done. So it can be useful when somebody is complaining that, you know, they've been trying so hard and they're not manifesting something, you can use this as a kind of grid to get to know, specify what is not developed that needs to be developed there. So that's the foundational archetypes. Now, these foundational archetypes are not something Jung came up with. He did not like Tony Wolf's uh, descriptions for some reason. We'll never know why. But he had his own in a book called Eon or Ion. It's volume nine, two of the collected works. He has all these diagrams. So he has his own quaternity he's trying to work out. And it's very esoteric and hard to use. So I, I think that's why. Tony Wolf and Robert Moore and myself have all been directed ourselves towards a simpler, clearer uh, quadrate of four foundational archetypes. It's like a medicine wheel or a mandala. You can see these major parts of yourself that need to be in place and need to be healthy and active for you to manifest your purpose in life or your mission or your dream. All right, we'll take some questions on that. Okay. Yeah. Um, speaking of Ion, uh, let me, I'll get to you in a second. I've got a couple that have come through in the meantime. Oh, yes, we have Ion Fiber Hour there, I see. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. So, first of all, I just wanted to highlight uh, something you said. I mean, um, I love it. I guess I'll paraphrase, but it would make a great uh, needle point. If you neglect your diamond, it turns into a demon. Mm -hmm. That's a good takeaway for me from that talk. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, I wonder, um, there's a couple of things I got to parse here. Let me see. So would you say that what you're calling a diamond or what we might call a power animal or guide in the shamanic journey, is that simply the archetypal heart taking a particular form so that we can more easily relate to it so that it can connect with us and speak with us? Are we talking about the same thing here? I think is the essence of that. Yes, I like to use different languages. Here, here's, you really have to be a poet. Uh... In, in essence, you know, uh, and choose the word that does it for you and will simply communicates in most contexts. So for me, that I, I prefer to use the heart most of the time, but I do want to speak to the daimon, which is uh, 
let's say a personification or a mask uh, by which it reveals itself to me. So it's like an interface, but it's a real being too. I mean, uh, once you start relating, you see, you know, I mean, I mean uh, my diamond uh, wakes me up in my dreams. It, it'll shout its name, you know. <laughs> it says, Mikhail, it says, Puchat in here, wake up. <laughs> and uh, it's a message. You know, it has a name, which I just said, it has a message for me, and I have to get up and write it down. Now, uh, <laughs> I'm connecting with something, but I am a fan of Henri Corbin, this uh, French uh, historian of religion who specialized in Sufic uh, mystics, Sufic scholars, the greats like Ibn Arabi and so on. And uh, his way of formulating it was that these are imaginal, not imaginary, imaginal which are visionary presences. They're experienced in visionary states. And they are the revelation of the divine specifically to you. Like everybody has one. Hawaiians call it omakua, you know. Um, uh, I think the Lakota call it Nagila, the Kitswa call it uh, Hanak, you know, Hanak Bacha. And uh, it reveals the face. It's like the face that God wants you to see. And that's called the daimo because it guides you, it inspires you, it leads you, it protects you. But if that's not your cup of tea, you know, I mean, you have to be kind of visionary and you like to take journeys and, or do active imagination like Jung did. Uh, then uh, you can go that way. But it's uh, essential, like Don Alberto really, you know, I, I told him about that and he would just say, that's your ushai, which means that's your essence. It's uniquely patterned. And Jung said of that, he said that um, the main thing is that you embody the, the essential. And if you do not embody that life is wasted. You have not become what you are. And that's highly unique. Everybody has their own archetype that is uniquely patterned. So it's not a universal archetype. It's one specific to you. It has your ideal form in it. And you're meant to manifest that as your true nature. Now, that's another way of talking about the daimo too. Okay. But mostly when I'm talking to people, they're not going to be interested in this esoteric, shamanic, or mystical way of speaking. But they will relate to the heart itself as a guide and source of inspiration and healing. Does that help? Yeah, I think that's, yeah, that's good. Again, this message to not get too hung up on language, find your own uh, poetry, yeah. find your own language of the heart and be inspired by people like Rumi and Jung and uh, your own teacher. You know? When Jung was writing the Red Book, there were all these letters he was exchanging with other people that were doing like similar work and trying to figure out should he go the route of poetry or not, you know, uh, because he was looking for languages to say this that would honor what's experienced but not alienate people, you know. He ended up translating it into psychological jargon, fortunately or unfortunately, but he was aware of this issue. <clears throat> yeah, and I find that often what I'm trying to do is translate. <laughs> Um, from psychology back into more of a poetic or yeah, shamanic yeah. kind of language. So you've yeah. been really helpful uh, yeah. for me with that. Okay, let's get to uh, Aya. You've been hanging in there. Um, please unmute and uh, speak up. Yeah, thank you. Um, Mikhail, thank you so much. Greetings, uh, Aya. It's good to see you. Good yeah. to see you too. I just want to share my personal experience with these four foundational archetypes. Um, I found them really, really very effective and very practical. I came to know them through Mikal's teachings a couple of years ago, and, and I read a blog that he has in his website that explains a little bit in details what they are. And when I reflected back in my own journey, um, I could notice how these archetypes are kind of going around this medicine will, and really uh, some of them are dominating in certain periods in, in our lives. You know, sometimes we need to just go to our 
cave and just deepen our relationship with ourselves and and our inner worlds and kind of gain that shamanistic kind of clarity and then the warrior uh, archetypes is awakens uh, and it's time to trans transform yeah so it's it's so wonderful and, and i raised my hand first because i saw that image at the beginning of the workshop i was hoping that you to talk about it and i lowered my hand and uh, and uh, and really thank you and i really really wanted to share this because this these four archetypes if you reflect on them is they are very very deep and very transforming i just wanted to make that point thank you i appreciate it i am a member of the crow's nest community a senior member and a psycho shamanic practitioner and ifs therapist we've had lots of good conversations i would say i that uh, with brian and i we started out really with a lot of lover energy and shamanic energy in dreaming up this workshop okay and then we had to make decisions okay what are we going to put it put in it there's only a symbol full you can put in four presentations you know so what's it going to be and then there's the whole thing of uh getting everything uploaded and organized you know in terms of social media and zoom and all that and letting people know and that's all warrior you know so it takes a lot of work it's not all warrior you have to keep the lover and the shaman in there and the elder too you know to represent them but it illustrates your point uh i would say the last leg of our work was heavy warrior energy would you agree uh, brian yeah it's funny to think about the whole process uh, through that lens um but definitely, yeah, it comes from that first impulse to want to share something that could be helpful. Definitely that lover, elder kind of energy. And then me having to call on my um, natural magician inclination and abilities to put all the technical things together. Uh, and then, yeah, lots of worry just to get yeah. up and get going, man. Yeah. yeah. And uh, for, yeah, everyone else, We'll be, uh, we'll share uh, in the resources for this particular class, we'll share that image of the mandala and any kind of write up or descriptions that uh, Michael's got in the archives, we'll, we'll put up on there so you have access to that. Uh, great, Finn in Toronto, please unmute. Um, thank you very much for, um, for this material. Um, I'm interested in understanding where I can find resources to help me with my choices and maintaining healthy relationship. And I say this specifically with regards to my marriage now of 26 years. Um, as I, with honesty and transparency, start reading and journeying more and feeling into these things, it's creating challenges within my relationship and my intention is to be um, graceful and kind and respectful however it's also leading to much uh, challenge and um, without getting into intimate details um, it's it's becoming more uh, distracting, I find, than it is to maintaining a healthy relationship. Uh, is there any sort of place one can start reading to help uh, help feel into and navigate these things? Um, there's a book by uh, Adolf Guggenbill Craig called Marriage Dead or Alive. Yeah. And the uh, Guggenbill was a director of the Jung Institute uh, a few decades back uh, in Zurich. But uh, it, the book, the axis of the book is around uh, individuation, which is essentially the heart path, living from your center and becoming more whole and expressing your unique individuality. And how do you do that with another person? 
And what are the effects of that on the marriage? And how can marriage partners navigate that? So I, I think that would be the book, Marriage, Dead or Alive. Okay. Yeah, and I'm, I'm trying to collect all the links to the resources that uh, Michael's mentioning in the chat. I see I just sent that to someone specifically, but let me uh, let me send that out so you can all have easy access to that. Okay, so you can look in the chat too. Uh, just any names that are mentioned, I'm trying to just get those in there so it's clear for you guys. Um, okay, I see we've got a we've just got five minutes left, Michael. Um, would you like to close things up, or do you want to take one more question? I think we could take one more question. And we, we started a few minutes late. I think I'm comfortable with that if you are. You know. Yeah, sure. Uh, OK. Could you expand on the shadow magician in relating to the shaman specifically? So maybe uh, just opening up a bit more around shadow aspects of that um, inner shaman or inner magician. Yeah. Well, I really ran into that shadow side in the jungle, the Amazonian jungle, Peruvian uh, Amazon. So not up in the high Andes where the shamans are of the same ilk as Tibetan lamas. I mean, they're, they're just, you know, really lofty, very centered. Uh, um, I'm not saying in every case, but that's the, the difference in the jungle uh there's been more competition amongst uh the uh, shamans and curanderos and curanderos because of uh essentially white western civilization descending uh on the jungle uh since 1990 in search of ayahuasca and other uh power plants and pharmaceuticals and uh this means that uh there's a competition for money and who gets these uh, dollars from what looks like white affluent people coming into very poor territory so what i saw there was very distasteful and uh, uh not it, by any means would every curandero or shaman do this but i saw lots of manipulation and exploitation there and uh, I learned that uh, the concept of an uh, envious shaman uh, was frequent enough that uh, almost every shaman had counteracting spells uh, for damage that uh, a black shaman or dark shaman might do. And uh, it was a real education for me to finally see up hand close what it looked like when somebody was uh, expressing using their gifts their their uh, high level of calling uh, for egocentric purposes and to exploit other human beings uh, but that is the shadow side uh, because uh, what you have with any uh, shadow side it's the polarity to the perceived positive side so whatever you identify and own as you uh it casts a, a shadow of disowned parts that you recognize is not you and that can show up if if you say the shaman is conscious well then where is its unconscious part if you say the shaman is a technician of the sacred well where is it not a good technician or a technician of something more destructive if you say the shaman is a healer well, where is the shaman of harmer and so on. And so you can take all the descriptive words, just make a list and there you'll find the opposite of any of these archetypes. The undeveloped side will reveal itself. And uh, my point of view on it is that uh, uh, no matter who you are, you have a shadow side. So you better get to know it and radically accept those parts and uh, do not harm, uh, do not act out anything socially that would cause harm and try to give creative expression to anything that is destructive or harmful or unhealed in yourself. 
And that can be done through painting, through art, through music, through dance, you know, but don't put it into human circulation. And I think that's the obligation for every shamanist, you know, is to realize they do have a shadow. They do need to take responsibility for it. Not to hate themselves, not to judge themselves. Radical acceptance. And if you can, unconditional love. But with radical acceptance, you say, okay, I realize I don't agree with you and you look kind of ugly to me, but I'm not going to judge you. I'm going to help you. I'm going to respect you by helping you find ways to express yourself that cause no harm. Until such time as maybe they're ready for healing. Great. Uh, Forrest, you want to unmute and ask a question? Yeah, I just want to follow up, uh, McCall, with that sort of polarity on the archetypes there, knowing, or more specifically, the shadows. So once those are revealed, um, is there a, an urgency to transmute those to the positive polarity or you know, having knowing that polarities are a necessity, um, are we just simply to acknowledge the polarity and and know that they're there, and rather than trying to transmute them to a positive polarity? Yeah, Jung was very much like a Taoist. You know, so wherever there's light, there will be dark. You know, wherever there's up, there will be downs. There's up cycles and down cycles. So you can't get rid of the polarity. It's part of the manifest order things fall into polarity like yang and yin and they imply each other so the thing is to make your dark side less dense more a creative ally than to think you can get rid of it if you think you can get rid of it then you get caught in an obsession that will never work and you will still have a shadow and it may be denser than before so it's better to accept that this is part of nature you know everything casts a shadow every light casts a shadow i've got this and so Every stage of life, really every day, but every stage of life, uh, our shadow may change because we may love more of ourselves. We may include more of ourselves. There's gold in the shadow, you know, stuff that we repress because we were told it wasn't any good. When it turns out, there's nothing wrong with it. You know, a lot of our sexuality goes in the shadow and it gets darker because it's there. So as soon as you throw a light on that, okay, something else will go in the shadow. Whatever you're looking at, focusing on and identifying with will cast its shadow. So the work is to be observant and contemplative and look and take a sweep of your whole system and see what lives there and care for what lives there. For Jung, there was no perfectionism. And I think that's pretty much true of shamanism too. There's, there's, <laughs> there's nobody without a shadow. Hmm. Yeah, I think he said something like, uh, I'd rather be whole than good. Yeah, right, right. Okay. Okay, so uh, we're good. Yeah, we'll, everyone's uh, everyone's satisfied here, Michael. So I'll leave okay. it to you to close us up. So next week we'll be dealing with challenges and obstacles on the heart path. We all these kind of relate to each other, and we've already just started to move into that by talking about the shadow side of things. Uh, and uh, the fourth week we'll have to deal with some actual practices we can use to get to know where we're wounded, get to know what's in the shadow and how to work with them. So we'll build on what we discussed today. I didn't get around to one other point and I can work it into the two remaining uh, classes that uh, there are four acts of power that you can use uh, to know you're walking your own heart path. And uh, I'll say more about those next time, but I meant to get them in. They're part of this whole archetypal presentation, but they'll fit in elsewhere. So I want to thank you for coming and uh, remind you that wind is the theme this week. And uh, if you're in a place where you can walk outside and uh, just follow the wind or sit with it and see what you notice, use your heart's navigational system to see what's agreeable or disagreeable. Or if you're inside, you know, you can follow the scent of things. Or if you have a flute, you know, you can use your breath to extend the length of your plane, playing just one note, you know, and explore how it feels to breathe differently. So you increase the out breath, take a big in breath and increase the out breath. And by playing a simple reed flute, you can learn to breathe better. 
and uh, be more aware, more conscious, more present. Or any other way of working with the wind that you can imagine, you know. If you're stressed, step outside, take some deep breaths, take off your hat, let the wind blow through your hair. Just kind of be with the power of the wind a bit. All right. So we'll close with a prayer. Powers above, powers below, powers all around, draw close. Thank you for your teachings. Thank you for the wisdom of the elders and the ancestors coming through me today. Thank you for us being together. What a wonderful thing it is to be together in some type of connection. Oh, till next time.